This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 1 for September 26 to October 2, Education in the Garden of Eden. Here we read the introduction to the series of lessons for October, November and December 2020. This Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been written by various presidents of Seventh-day Adventist colleges and universities in North America. It's titled Christian Education. The introduction reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 9 verse 10. Think about the above text. It entails really two closely related concepts. Fear, as in awe, as in marvelling at the glory and power of God, and knowledge, as in learning truth about the character of God. Hence, wisdom, knowledge and understanding are rooted in God himself. This makes perfect sense. After all, God is the source of all existence, the one alone who created and sustains all existence, as we read in John 1, 1 1-3 and Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Whatever we learn, whatever we know about, quarks, caterpillars, supernovas, angels, demons, principalities and powers in heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians 3.10, everything. They exist only because of God. Hence, all true knowledge and wisdom and understanding ultimately have their source in the Lord himself. Scripture is clear. God is love, as we read in 1 John 4 verse 8, which explains this quote from Ellen G. White, from Education, page 16. Love, the basis of creation and of redemption, is the basis of true education. This is made plain in the law that God has given us, the guide of life. The first and great commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Luke 10.27 To love him, the infinite, the omniscient one, with the whole strength and mind and heart, means the highest development of every power. It means that in the whole being, the body, the mind, as well as the soul, the image of God is to be restored. End of quote. Because the Lord is the source of all true knowledge, all true education, all Christian education should direct our minds towards Him and toward His own revelation about Himself. Through nature, through the written word, through the revelation of Christ in that written word, we have been given all that we need, and then some, to come to a saving relationship with our Lord, and indeed to love Him with all our heart and soul. Even nature, so defiled by thousands of years of sin, still speaks, even powerfully, of the goodness and character of God when studied from the perspective given us in Scripture. But the written word, the Scriptures, is the perfect standard of truth, the greatest revelation we have of who God is and what He has done and is doing for humanity. Scripture and its message of creation and redemption must be central to all Christian education. The Apostle Paul said that Jesus Christ is the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1 9. In other words, just as only through Jesus does every human being have life, through Jesus every human being receives some rays of divine light, some understanding of transcendent truth and goodness. Yet, we're all in a struggle, the great controversy in which the enemy of souls works diligently to block us from receiving this knowledge. Thus, whatever else Christian education entails, it must obviously seek to help students better understand the light that God offers us from heaven. Otherwise what? As Jesus said, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8.36 What good is a great education in science, literature, economics or engineering if in the end you face the second death in the lake of fire? 
The answer is obvious, isn't it? Thus, the topic for our lesson this quarter, what does it mean to have a Christian education, and how can we as a church in one way or another find a way so that all our members are able to get such an education? Sabbath afternoon, September 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that from Genesis to Revelation there's an education for each of us. And the centre of that education is your love and your grace expressed in the birth and life and death and resurrection and soon coming of Jesus Christ so that salvation can be ours. And as we open your word this week, as we look at the books of Genesis and the ones Peter wrote and and Paul's letter to the Hebrews, we pray, Lord, that your spirit will guide us and bless us, that we may know not only who you are, but that you care for us and that we can put our trust in you. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Job chapter 36 and verse 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power, who teaches like him. Let's read that again, Job 36, verse 22. Behold, God is exalted by his power, who teaches like him. Most Bible students know the story of Genesis 1 to 3 and its cast of characters. God, Adam, Eve, the angels, the serpent. The setting is a splendid garden in a paradise called Eden. The plot line seems to follow a logical series of events. God creates, God instructs Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve sin, Adam and Eve are banished from Eden. However, a closer look at the first few chapters of Genesis, especially through the lens of education, will uncover insights into the cast, the setting and the story. As Ellen White writes in Education, page 20, The system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom, nature was the lesson book, the Creator himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. End of quote. The Lord was founder, principal, and teacher of this first school. But, as we know, Adam and Eve ultimately chose another teacher and learned the wrong lesson. What happened? Why? And what can we learn from this early account of education that can help us today? Sunday, September 27. The First School. Though we don't think of a garden as a classroom, it makes perfect sense, especially one like Eden, filled with the unspoiled riches of God's creation. It is hard to imagine, from our perspective today, how much these unfallen beings in an unfallen world, and being directly taught by their Creator, must have been learning in that classroom. Question, read Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 to 23. What do you notice about God's purposefulness in creating, placing, and employing Adam? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bdellium and the Onk stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. God made the man and the woman in his image and gave them a home and meaningful work. When you consider the teacher-student dynamics, this is an ideal relationship. God knew Adam's abilities because he had created Adam. He could teach Adam, knowing that Adam could realise his full potential. God gave the man responsibility, but he also wanted happiness for him as well. And perhaps part of the means of giving him happiness was giving him responsibilities. After all, who doesn't get satisfaction, happiness even, from being given responsibilities and then faithfully fulfilling them? God knew the heart of Adam and what he would need to thrive. So he gave Adam the task of taking care of the garden. As it said in verse 15, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. It's hard for us to imagine, knowing only a world of sin and death as we do, what the work must have entailed, and the lessons that, no doubt, Adam learned as he worked and kept their garden home. In Genesis 2, 19-23, God created animal companions for Adam, and he also created Eve as Adam's wife. God knew that Adam needed the companionship and help of a peer, so he created woman. God also knew that man needed to be in close relationship with him, so he created an intimate space in Eden within the confines of the garden. All of this attests to God's purposefulness in creation and his love for humanity. Again, From the great distance between us and Eden, it's hard to imagine what it must have been like. Though it is fun to try to imagine, isn't it? Though we are far removed from Eden, we can still learn lessons from nature. What are some of those lessons, and how can we benefit from them as we interpret them through the lens of Scripture? Monday, September 28. Intrusion. One of the great joys for many teachers is assembling their classrooms, hanging bulletin boards, organising supplies and arranging the rooms in the most desirable way. 
When we look at God's vision for the classroom, that was the Garden of Eden, we see the care he took in preparing a learning environment for Adam and Eve. He desired beauty to surround them. We can imagine that every flower, bird, animal and tree offered an opportunity for Adam and Eve to learn more about their world and about their Creator. Yet there is an abrupt shift from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3. We have taken inventory of all the good that God created with divine intention. But in Genesis 3 verse 1, we also awaken to God's provision for free will. The presence of the serpent is more subtle than any beast of the field, is a departure from the language heretofore used. Such words as very good and not ashamed and pleasant are adjectives used to describe God's creation in the prior chapters. Now, however, with the serpent, there is a change of tone. The word subtle also is translated in some versions as cunning. Suddenly, a negative element is introduced in what so far has been only perfection. In contrast, Genesis presents God as the opposite of cunning. God is emphatically clear about his expectations of the pair in the garden. We know from God's command in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 that he has established one key rule that they must obey, and that was not to eat from the forbidden tree. Whatever else we can take from this story, one thing stands out. Adam and Eve were created as free moral beings, beings who were able to choose between obedience and disobedience. Hence, right from the start, even in an unfallen world, we can see the reality of human free will. Question. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, examine the descriptions the serpent used and that Eve then repeated. What do you notice about the information that the serpent offers Eve? What do you notice about how Eve then regards the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Genesis 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. In Genesis 2 verse 17, the Lord told Adam that if he ate from the tree he would surely die. When Eve, in Genesis 3 3, repeated the command, she did not express it as strongly, leaving out the word surely. In Genesis 3-4, the serpent puts the word back in, but in an utter contradiction to what God had said. It seems that though Eve was taught of God in the garden, she didn't take what she learned as seriously as she should have, as we can see from the very language she used. Tuesday, September 29. Missing the Message As we saw yesterday, Eve, even in her language, watered down what she had been taught despite God's clear command. Though she didn't misinterpret what the Lord said to her, she obviously didn't take it seriously enough. One can hardly exaggerate the consequences of her actions. Thus, when Eve encountered the serpent, she repeated, 
but not exactly to the serpent what God had said regarding the trees in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Of course, this message wasn't news to the serpent. The serpent was familiar with the command and was therefore well prepared to twist it, plus preying upon Eve's innocence. Question. Examine Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Besides directly denying exactly what God had said, what else did the serpent say that obviously succeeded with Eve? What principles did he take advantage of? Genesis 3, beginning at verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. When the serpent told her that part of the message was incorrect, Eve could have gone to confer with God. This is the beauty of Eden's education. The access the students had to their mighty teacher was surely beyond anything we can now fathom on earth. However, instead of fleeing, instead of seeking divine aid, Eve accepts the serpent's message. Her acceptance of the serpent's revision to the message requires some doubt on Eve's part about God and what he had told them. Meanwhile, Adam wanders into a difficult situation himself. As Ellen White writes on Patriarchs and Prophets, page 56, Adam understood that his companion had transgressed the command of God, disregarding the only prohibition laid upon them as a test of their fidelity and love. There was a terrible struggle in his mind. He mourned that he had permitted Eve to wander from his side. But now the deed was done. He must be separated from her whose society had been his joy. How could he have it thus? End of quote. Unfortunately, though knowing right from wrong, he also chose wrongly. So to finish the day, think of the deceptive irony here. The serpent said that if they ate of the tree, they would be like God in Genesis 3 verse 5. But didn't Genesis one twenty seven say that they were already like God? What can this teach us about how easily we can be deceived and why faith and obedience are our only protection, even when we have been given the best of educations, as had Adam and Eve? And Genesis one twenty seven read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. Wednesday, September 30. Regaining what was lost. When Adam and Eve chose to follow the serpent's message, they faced, among many other consequences, banishment from God's classroom. Think about what Adam and Eve lost because of their sin. When we understand their fall, we can better understand the purpose of education for us in the present age. In spite of their banishment, life in an imperfect world ushered in a new purpose for education. If education before the fall was God's way of acquainting Adam and Eve with him, his character, his goodness and his love, then after their banishment, the work of education must be to help reacquaint humanity with those things as well as recreate the image of God in us. In spite of their physical removal from God's presence, God's children can still come to know Him, His goodness and His love. Through prayer, service and studying His Word, we can draw close to our God as did Adam and Eve in Eden. The good news is that because of Jesus and the plan of redemption, all is not lost. 
we have hope of salvation and of restoration, and much of Christian education should be pointing students toward Jesus and what he has done for us, and the restoration that he offers. Question. Read Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. In light of all that was lost when human beings left the garden, these verses come as encouragement that much can be regained. What does Peter write that we must do in order to seek restoration of God's image in our lives? Second Peter 1, beginning at verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. What a promise! What might some of those things be? Well, Peter gives us a list. Faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, and so on. Notice, too, that knowledge is one of the things Peter mentions. This idea, of course, leads to the notion of education. True education will lead to true knowledge, the knowledge of Christ. And thus, not only will we become more like Him, but we also may stand to share our knowledge of Him with others. So, to finish the day. Think for a moment about the fact that the forbidden tree was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2.17. What should that tell us about why not all knowledge is good? How do we know the difference between good and bad knowledge? Thursday, October 1. The Despisers of Authority Some people are considered natural students in the classroom. They barely need to study to make excellent grades. They absorb material easily. Their knowledge seems to stick. Second Peter 1 and 2, however, make it evident that our education in Christ is an equal opportunity experience for those who will dedicate themselves to Him. The encouraging word of 2 Peter 1 contrasts with the sobering warnings in 2 Peter chapter 2. Question, read 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 1 to 17. What powerful and condemning words is Peter saying here? At the same time, amid this sharp warning and condemnation, what great hope is promised to us? 2 Peter chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words." For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. 
For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Whereas angels, who are greater in power and might, do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. But these, like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand, and will utterly perish in their own corruption, and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices, and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way, and gone astray, following the way of Balaam the son of Baal, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for ever. Notice what Peter writes in verse 10 about those who despise authority. Let's have a look at that. Verse 10, And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. What a sharp rebuke for what is a reality in our day as well. We, as a church body, must work on the assumption of certain levels of authority. As we read in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And verse 17, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. And verse 24. Greet all those who rule over you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. And we are called to submit to and obey them, at least to the degree that they are being faithful to the Lord themselves. However, amid this harsh condemnation, Peter offers a counterpoint. He says that, Although God is mighty to cast out those who chose deception, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. 2 Peter 2 verse 9 It is possible that part of our education in Christianity is not only avoiding temptation, but also learning the many ways that God can and does deliver us from it, as well as help guard us against those. Peter warns, who will secretly bring in destructive heresy, 2 Peter 2, verse 1. And, since the despising of authority is so condemned, shouldn't our Christian education also consist of learning the right way to understand, submit, and obey those who rule over you? Though we could not say that Adam and Eve despised authority, in the end they chose to disobey that authority. And what made their transgression so bad was that they did it in response to a blatant contradiction of what that authority, God himself, 
had told them, and who had done so for their own good as well. And so to finish the day, dwell more on this question of authority, not just in the church or in the family, but in life in general. Why is authority, both the proper exercise of authority and the proper submission to it, so important? Bring your answers to class on Sabbath. Friday, October 2. From the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 50 and 51, we read, The holy pair were not only children under the fatherly care of God, but students receiving instruction from the all-wise Creator. They were visited by angels and were granted communion with their Maker with no obscuring veil between. They were full of the vigour imparted by the tree of life, and their intellectual power was but little less than that of the angels. The mysteries of the visible universe, or as it says in Job 37.16, the wondrous works of him which is perfect in knowledge, afforded them an exhaustless source of instruction and delight. The laws and the operations of nature which have engaged men's study for six thousand years were opened to their minds by the infinite framer and upholder of all. They held converse with leaf and flower and tree, gathering from each the secrets of its life. With every living creature, from the mighty leviathan that playeth among the waters to the insect moat that floats in the sunbeam, Adam was familiar. He had given to each its name, and he was acquainted with the nature and habits of all. God's glory in the heavens, the innumerable worlds in their orderly revolutions, the balancing of the clouds, the mysteries of light and sound, of day and night, all were open to the study of our first parents. On every leaf of the forest or stone of the mountains, in every shining star, in earth and air and sea, God's name was written. The order and harmony of creation spoke to them of infinite wisdom and power. They were ever discovering some attraction that filled their hearts with deeper love and called forth fresh expressions of gratitude. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, if God originally intended for school or work to be an opportunity for humans to encounter Him and His creation— Are we still in keeping with God's intention in our work today? How can we become better acquainted with God through our work, whether it's paid, educational, voluntary, ministerial, etc.? 2. When we consider the craftiness of Satan in the Garden of Eden, it is easy to become frustrated with our own human weakness. Adam and Eve knew God was close, and yet they accepted the serpent's half-truth. How can we, who are removed from such close proximity to God, still find power from Him to help us to overcome temptation? And three, discuss the question of authority and why it is so important to obey that authority. What happens when the lines of authority become blurred? How can authority be abused? And how do we respond when it is? Inside Story Our mission story today is titled Helping a Distressed Priest and it's by Gabriel Golia. And Gabriel is Executive Secretary of the French-Belgian Union based in Paris, France. Helping a Distressed Priest The Romanian priest came to me with a problem. Can you convince the Commission members that I have a good job and a good level of education so I can start my doctoral studies, he asked. 
The priest had enrolled to study theology at the University of Strasbourg in France, but the doctoral commission had decided that he first needed to repeat a year of undergraduate studies. I was a second-year doctoral student, and he and I struck up a friendship when we realised that we both were from Romania. "'Do you believe in God?' I asked the priest, smiling. He was shocked. "'Of course I do,' he said. "'Do you believe in the power of prayer?' I said. "'I believe that God can do miracles,' the priest said. "'I'm not talking about a ritual or some other religious ceremony,' I said. "'God can answer our prayers if we pray directly to Him.' Several days later, I invited the priest to pray with me. Before I asked the professors, "'We should make this a matter of prayer,' I said. The priest agreed. I decided not to try to convince the professors to change the rules for the priest, but instead to show them that Romania's education system met French standards. I met with each of the seven professors who sat on the commission. Each promised to review the matter at the next commission meeting. The professors ended up testing the priest's knowledge in a special interview and accepting him into the doctoral program. We thank God for the miracle. Our friendship flourished over the next two years. The priest often visited my home to talk, eat and worship with my family. But during his third year, the priest announced that he would leave the program. I have a new job, he said. I have been appointed as Romania's Secretary of State for Religious Affairs. He had become the Romanian government's top religion official. You never know the far-reaching influence of your words and actions. Upon hearing that a priest had taken office, some Adventists in Romania feared restrictions on religious freedom, especially against members of small religious denominations like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But no crackdown materialised. In fact, the priest-turned-government minister was exceedingly fair and objective with people of all faiths. After he settled into his job, I jokingly asked to visit his office for a photo. I want to show my children that I know someone famous, I said. He laughed. Come any time you want, he said. We remain friends to this day. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.